Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for this Henry Stewart Dam web webinar series on semantic and graph databases and the evolution of digital asset management. My name is Damian Diaz, uh, Director of Marketing for IO Integration and on behalf of IO Integration and Sendshare, we'd like to thank you all for joining us and for Henry Stewart for providing this forum. Um, today's presenters will be Wendy Scolding, Business Development Product Manager at Sendshare, Rich Carroll, Technology Consultant from IO Integration, and Bill Covington, CEO, CTO of IO Integration. Just a couple uh, little housekeeping here. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so if you look in your GoToWebinar panel in the Questions tab, please answer all your questions there, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the presentation. With that being said, I'd like to turn this over to Rich Carroll. Thank you, Damien. Damien, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Fantastic. So uh, thank you again, everybody. I am planning on spending just about oh, 15 or 20 minutes or so talking about uh, graph databases, semantics, and the evolution of DAM. Uh, when I was first asked to do this, uh, I thought I was drawing a little bit of a short straw because it's a fairly difficult uh, concept to understand. But I realize it's actually an honor. It's a very uh, uh, interesting differentiation, and we're very excited about the advantages that graph databases bring to our uh, industry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of DAM, uh, specifically how hierarchical, relational, and graph databases differ, and specifically on how they manage what we would consider traditional assets, because uh, those assets really are evolving, uh, most importantly, and how those assets relate to one another and how they correlate to one another. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about how technology is uh, fundamentally changing that in a modern digital asset management. So <clears throat> way back when, 30-some uh, years ago, digital asset management really meant primarily local area networks, file shares. This was a common sort of uh, space on the network where everybody could go and um, access files. It re early DAM really was file management. Um, they started to layer fairly simplistic databases on top to manage the metadata, but really early DAMs were um, primarily just glorified file transfer and FTP sites with very simple relations between their assets and their metadata. Um, that had then evolved to um, broader sort of web portals for larger solutions that um, were managing more and more assets, but still really managing the files themselves. Uh, and then that helped funnel a lot of the growth in social media. You know, if you think of how many images you see on a daily basis on, on Facebook or Instagram or Flickr, um, you know, that's really all being driven by the expansion of the amount of assets that we're generating on the back end. So, you know, this, this is an opportunity here. The number of assets that we're creating every day is growing and it's not going to stop anytime soon. So I really want to consider this growth in assets, this expansion in media as an engine, an opportunity to really drive some changes in our industry. Um, those changes have really uh, lent the credence to big data, cloud, and, and SaaS solutions, all of which are trying to, uh, amongst other things, they're also trying to manage these, these pools and seas and oceans of data. Um, the, next the next evolution in DAM is really to manage not just the files or the assets themselves, but the information about those assets. And semantic graph databases allow us to have a view into that big data so that we can kind of shape that fire hose of information into a more machine-readable structure because what's coming next, obviously, is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I don't know that many people would disagree with that. So what is an asset? If you think about what DAMs do, they house lots of different file types and they track all of that metadata in a database. Before semantic graph databases, um, we used hierarchical and relational databases to have kind of the simple association between the asset and a piece of metadata. So you have pretty much a one-to-one -one notion or what I like to refer to as an equals. This equals that, this equals that, this equals that. Uh, the file name equals John and Mary, the file type equals JPEG, the date created equals uh, October 27th. Really that equal sign was the extent of our vocabulary and we've done some amazing things with it but we're certainly bumping up against the limitations of the 
what we can express using only this this equals that, this equals that, and this equals that. So I want to show you a little bit here in a um, hierarchical database how, I'm sorry, in a relational database how this information is managed. Most databases will have um, what they call a file table, and this is really a key pair where you have like file ID equals such and such or file name equals such and such. You can think of it almost like as an Excel spreadsheet with two columns where the first column is the file name and then the second column would be the, the name itself or the first column would be creator and the second column would be, well, this is made out of Photoshop. So this is a very simple table um, and in this case we actu actually also have a file ID. We're going to use that file ID to do a search across um, uh, the larger digital asset management solution. So in this case, if I wanted to look and say, for this asset, can you show me who made an annotation on it? I would look in the file table and I would say, okay, in all of this information, I want to um, find specifically the file ID. And then I'm going to go into the annotations table and use that file ID to do another lookup there. I'm using that same key pair. And then when I do a lookup in the annotations table, I can also see the user ID. And I'll take that user ID and then go to the user table and do another search. So to do a fairly simple search, I'm going to touch three different tables um, to get the information. This is what we call a, a join, or basically uh, doing a query from one table to the next to the next. As you can see, complex reports or searches um, would join many tables together, and each one of those joins has a cost in processing time to execute a search. Basically what that means is the more joins you have or the deeper searches you have, the longer it's going to take to execute those and return some results back. There are ways to manage that by adding indexes, but fundamentally we're still bumping up against the issue that we have this very large um, number of tables and there's some uh, discussion back and forth for how you balance those tables and how deep those tables are and how many tables uh, you have overall. Um, a quick side note, some asset management systems actually also store the file itself in a table and what they, what's known as a blob or a binary large object, they'll actually stick the, the TIFF or the JPEG or the movie file into one of these tables. Uh, but you can see that starts to add to the overall size of these tables. And this, what I'm illustrating here is a fairly modest table map. And for each one of these tables, I have to have a record for every uh, note that I want to keep track of. So in this case, here in the middle, I know it's hard to see, but this is the file table. And here is the annotations table, and here is the user table. So in the user table, I'm going to have a record for each and every user. So I may have dozens or even hundreds of users. In the annotation table, I'm going to have a record for every annotation, and I may have hundreds or thousands of annotations. In the file table, I'm going to have a record for every file, and I may have thousands or millions of files. So if I need to do a search and hit just these three tables and I'm doing a search across millions and millions of records, obviously that's going to take some time and some effort and some computational expense. This is um, exacerbated by very large, heavy data sets like we would find in education or legal or healthcare or in large collections like museums or zoos or what you would find in supply chain management like using large uh, PIMs to manage product information in retail and manufacturing. This is um, also difficult to address for complex usage rights and permissions. So we have this very complex landscape and we're trying to navigate this very complex landscape with a very simple tool just that, that equals. Trying to express um, very advanced fundamental concepts using a very simple tool. So let's talk about digital file management as we know it. Up until now, when talking about assets, we've only been dealing with the files, but with a file or files and its associated metadata. So the question is, can an asset be more than a file? Does it have to be concrete at all, or could it be something abstract, like a person, or an advertisement, or an idea, or nothing? As an analogy, we could talk about the concept of zero in mathematics. It took centuries to emerge, but really was a huge breakthrough because it allowed for the theoretical or conceptual, the, the metaphys metaphysical or academic view of how we count numbers. A zero itself is nothing 
but without a zero, you cannot count anything. Therefore, a zero is something, yet zero. You're like mind blown, right? Very deep. Um, what today to us seems fairly simple and easy to understand um, hundreds of years ago was revolutionary in how we um, thought about mathematics. And in a similar vein, abstraction in databases also is fundamentally a different way of looking at how we manage this information. Because we can represent something that does not exist or may exist at some future stage. So a quick example of abstraction would be this empty coffee cup. The cup itself is a container asset, right? The same coffee cup it can be an asset by itself or it can be an asset that contains other things like coffee, the foam, the chocolate, as well as the cup. Assets do not have to be do not have to have something concrete associated with them. The assets themselves can be many assets. So are these really dams? If your dam can your dam manage nothing or the lack of an asset? Most dam software is essentially digital file management software with very advanced functionality, but still inherently limited in its ability to deal with anything abstract. An asset should be anything you can think of or nothing at all. Any kind of asset, even abstract. Abstracted assets can be more than just a single file. It can be thousands of files. It can be things that aren't files, like resource planning or people. Or they can be strategic things altogether. Let me give you another example of how we would track metadata without abstraction. So in this simple example, we have John, we have Mary, and they're in love. The problem is John also loves to drive his Mazda. Now, how do we describe love between John and the Mazda and John and Mary? They don't really mean the same things, but we're limited in how we express that in traditional databases. Also, if Mary occasionally drives the car, does that have the same meaning as John's love of driving the car? And how do we wait or provide relevance to her opinion of the car if maybe she's a social maven and you know puts lots of information up. So there's limitations in how you express each of these in this very simple relationship how we express each of these relations without even getting into more complex information about the car itself when it was purchased where and why and normally to do that in a traditional database model we would either use a number of different databases or a number of different tables and it becomes um, expensive from a computational standpoint to express all of that information. In a relational database, we're changing how that information is stored about the asset. So we really have abstracted away the information and the asset itself. Graph databases have what they call a triple, or a node, an edge, and a property. A graph database is really the whiteboard database. The physical model itself is the database model. So in this case, in a graph database, we have an asset and metadata about it. We also have the relationship between these two assets, and we have metadata about that relationship. And as we start to build ever more complex uh, illustrations of these databases, we are able to query not just the assets and their particular metadata, but the relationship between all of those assets and all of the metadata. Instead of a simple equals in a graph database, we have this triple. Another way to look at it is a subject, predicate, and object. It's really a way to tell a story as opposed to a simple notion of this equals that, this equals that. If we go back to John loving Mary, and Mary occasionally driving the Mazda, and John being enthusiastic about the Mazda, John loving Mary and John loving the Mazda clearly mean different things, or at least for Mary's sake, I hope so. But in a semantic database, it allows us to describe those relationships differently and provide different weight, different meaning, different context. So each one of these examples of how John and Mary are interrelated with the Mazda has different meaning and has different weight. It is not an expression of a simple this equals that, this equals that, but we actually have a semantic understanding of John's love for Mary is different than his love for his Mazda. If I look at another example, we, and the correlation between John and Mary, 
we can also have multiple different pieces of metadata about the relationship itself between two assets. So not only is John in love with Mary, John also went to school with Mary, and John also races with Mary. We can have multiple attributes across each, each relation. So in this case, Mary authored a blog about Japanese police cars. She, that blog was then posted back up on Facebook, and it got lots of uh, social likes. What was interesting is because Mary referenced a Japanese police car, it also got picked up by the corporate PR department because they know that Mary speaks Japanese. And in this case, the, within the relationship between this Japanese police car and Mary, we not only know that she speaks Japanese, but that's different than being able to than being fluent in Japanese or being able to write Japanese, or it's also different than the fact that she is fluent in Spanish. Right? Each of those um, nuances allows us to have a better understanding of the relationship between these different assets. And this is a very simple example. Right? We can expand this out. We can look at their, the fact that those two raced together and they went to an event, and we can have information about that event in the properties of the database. Um, the event had some branding that was done through corporate marketing. We can actually manage the volunteer list itself as an asset or the empty volunteer list. If we're setting up an event, we can say, well, here's the information that we want about the volunteers, even though we don't know who all of those volunteers are yet. All of this information can be managed abstracted away from an asset. I don't actually need files in a database to manage this information in a graph database. Semantic databases are necessary because today's world has this huge network of assets that are all interrelated. That complexity is only going to increase, and it's not easy for a human mind to navigate alone. The only tools that are capable of extracting meaningful, meaningful content and information from this network are semantic databases. The holy trinity of the digital era, era are assets, metadata, and their context or re their relationships to each other. We need a nuanced understanding of how they interoperate. Metadata and taxonomies only describe one aspect of an asset, and assets are more complex than just a file or a group of files. They're more like human beings in that they have multiple facets and they mean different things in different contexts. Metadata can and should be more than this equals that or this equals that. That association between an asset and its metadata itself has tremendous value. Relational and hierarchical databases are limited in their ability to extract meaningful and contextual information about assets. Semantic links and correlations creates value from raw data. Most of what people call DAM today is not actually DAM. If you're living in part of this, then you're living in a flat world. Your system is not living in reality. DAM needs to be more than just asset management. It needs to be information management. The association and context between them has weight and relevance and value. If we look at all of the different databases that are being used across uh, larger IT landscapes, including CRM, PIM, MRM, ERP, and merge them with a graph database, then we really start to be able to envision a true dam and understand how those assets have relevance in the world. Your world is no longer flat. Your dam now relates to the real world. Because all of these assets, this ocean of files and videos and movies and all of this metadata that's associated with them threatens to be nothing without a true semantic understanding of how they correlate. Thank you. So Wendy, I think uh, at this point I'd like to pass it over to you for a uh, short demonstration of how hierarchical, uh, relational, and semantic databases uh, are used in the real world. I want to unmute myself. Hi. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Um, I hope you can see my screen. And I'm going to show you, you some great stuff. I'm going to try and show you some examples of what Rich was describing in his semantic graph database presentation there. So I have a few assets. I'm logged into my system here. I have a few different types of assets to kind of demonstrate how that hangs together. So if I look, for, first of all, for example, at a relational asset, this is just a picture. It's sitting in my system, and it has no context to anything else. All we know is that it's an image. It's a JPEG. It's got some metadata assigned to it. 
but it doesn't have any context. We don't know what it belongs to, we don't know what it's related to, and as you can see in the middle here, the selected asset has no relations. Poor relational asset. So what's the point of having that? You know, what is the, the point of having an asset where we don't know what it's, what it's used for? Let's have a look at a hierarchical asset now. Now, this is kind of like old school standard folder structure. So I have a hierarchical tree with different subfolders underneath that I can then navigate through to find my ultimate asset image, whatever it may be. But it's kind of a one-way street. We just have the main heading group, the child groups, the child's folders, and so on and so on until eventually we get to a single asset. So again, that doesn't really show us the context, the relationship specifically of that end image that may be in a folder somewhere down this tree. And this is the more traditional view of file management. However, if we take Rich's example of that chap, um, what was his name again? Can't remember. Anyway, the one who loved Mary. John. John, there you go. So this is how we would represent an abstract type of asset, a person in a graph database. And we can see here that this chap, I've called him graph just for the purposes of remembering what it is. We can see that he's got different types of context, different relationships to other assets in our system. And as I scroll out, we'll see that these relationships, of course, there are lots of relationships that we have in here. And going back to Rich's example, you know, he loves Mary. He likes racing, the Mazda racing team. He's actually competing in an event. He's liked some different articles that are available on our website. He's following other people on the website. He has followers. He's bought a car. Um, he's bookmarked some stuff. I can see how he's interacting and what the context of his particular being is inside our system. And if I go through a little bit further, let's go to our race of the champions because that's what they're competing in. We can actually see that that asset in its own right has lots of different connections and relationships to other assets. So it has media. You know, there's going to be some point of sale, some banners, etc. Maybe some online advertising. It's actually located in Rome, so we can have a re relationship to the actual location. And I can see who's competing. So again, it's about the context of the content inside the system not about the metadata or what it is. If I just go back here one second, we can take the example that Rich showed about the, the mouse dump. So this guy's bought an MX-5. That MX-5 is in itself intrinsically related to the manufacturer, to perhaps you know, uh, an uh, outlet, a retailer who's selling it. It's got some awards, it's got some pictures, it's got some content, it's assigned for target groups. And all of these relationships are building up the meaning of the asset. Rather than the poor old relational asset up here, that lives on its own, we can see that a person, an abstract concept of an asset, is related to all these other different types of content. And that's what makes a graph database truly powerful, that you can have these different relational database, the, sorry, relations between the different types of content. But that's great, you know, how that's perfect, but in real life, how is that going to work? So let me go back to my dashboard here. In real life, you know, let's take the example of an image. You might have an image somewhere. This is a picture that we've actually used um, on different output channels. We've used it in print. We've used it in the online channel. I think we've even created a social media post. So this image does not live on its own. It has relations to other assets. And if we click on it here, we should be able to see the start of those relationships. So let's say, for example, this image, I don't know, let's say we needed to make a change or there was some issue with a picture, or there was some copyright problem. Traditionally, you would not be able to find out where it's been used in such a quick way. You would generally have to go through manually which folders do we put it in, where do we output it to, and so on. With a graph database, you can see all of those connections visually displayed in this example of where exactly we've used it. And as I zoom down, we can see, for example here, it's the main picture of something. It's got an author, it's actually been output to a website's been mentioned in a website, it's on their online channel, it's got different variants, it's, and so on. So now, pulling this particular image is not an issue, because I know exactly where it's been used. So that's kind of one of the real-life problems that, for example, um, retailers or manufacturers or publishers, whatever it may be, have with their content in a flat file management system, if you like. And this is what it would really look like in a graph database. So, that's also, you know, that's cool, that's how it should work. But, you know, as Rich was saying, an asset is not a file, and vice versa. An asset is ultimately a container, 
It has metadata associated to it, relationships associated to it, and somewhere along the workflow process, it will also have a file. So what I've done here is I've created an asset. It's an empty asset. It's actually a main headshot. And if I open that up, there's no actual file in there. There's some different variants, but we can see that it's authored by Henry Stewart Dam webinars. It's the main picture of an article. It's the media of something. It's got a rights contract, actually for a print output as well. So I can see that all of these different relationships have been created, but I actually don't have a file yet for this particular image asset. Because relationships can be built, metadata can be added, this whole contextual relationships between the content can be made without there actually being a file. So eventually, when, let's say we go through the whole workflow process, and I want to just actually upload a file into here, I'm just going to go to my desktop. There's my picture. Not being narcissistic here. <laughs> so I just added a file to that asset, and when I go back, I can see now we have the main picture in there, the different variants, and all the relationships are already there. The, the, the context has been created. This image is not on its own. I know that I've got rights associated. I know where it's been used before I even actually had the file. So that's one of the advantages of having a true digital asset management system, the ability to create these container assets, these kind of holders where you can put files in at certain points within the workflow and again make those relationships between the different pieces of content. So um, let's pass back to Rich. I think we're going to go back to the questions. Yeah, uh, I know Damien has been looking at any questions that came in during mm -hmm. the webinar, mm -hmm. uh, but please use the question in the chat um, uh, panel within your uh, session to ask us any questions. We're uh, both Wendy, myself, and Bill Covington are happy to uh, answer any questions you may have about graph databases and semantic relationships. And I'm quite interested to know from the audience, do you already have graph databases? Is it something that you have already and, and you've heard of before, or is it something new, this whole idea around contextual assets rather than just files. So I'd be interested to hear any feedback that people might have on where they are in their kind of status of having a graph database. Yeah, great. Well, I, we've got a couple questions in here, so I will start with the questions we have. Um, let's see. First question is, how does a graph database compare in size to a relational database? Bill, do you want to take that one? Sure. Sure, I can take that one. Um, in many cases, and in almost all cases, um, there is either a similarity in the actual size of the database, or in many cases, it can be less. Uh, it does depend, you know, very much on the number of uh, assets, but also on the number of relationship structures that are there. They are very small um, in all cases, but in in almost all cases, we've found comparison-wise that a relational database uh, and graph database run about similar comparison size. Okay, so is it, um, so there was a follow-up question, is it even better to use, is it even better to use the hierarchical or relational database instead of the graph database? So as, as we're moving forward, and, and I think as we're trying to present here in the, in the presentation, the graph database is allowing us now to be able to expand the uh, capabilities and the uh, within the asset management system to now bring in data that is not um, specifically metadata about a given file or given uh, element within the system. And so that really does bring significant value to the assets within the system. And I think that is really one of the key things as we're going forward, is what is the value of these files? Because we have so many files now that we're gathering in within these asset management systems. And it becomes much more difficult to value that data, but also use, repurpose it. Um, and even within the production process, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it makes it a little bit, it makes it easier to be able to track where and when that's used so that you can make updates more quickly and more readily. So I think that really is the key um, for the graph database and the abilities or the, the, the functionality within the graph database. Okay, I have another one here. It says, you mentioned that 
the relation the relationship slash context are automatically recognized. How was this set up to allow for that? So there are a few different ways that relationships are created. Um, relationships can be created manually, of course. They can be templated. So as soon as a new asset is created, it already has the right relationships to the other different types of assets. It can also be, um, for example, an automatic placement. So if I place an image on, let's say, an InDesign page for a print output, that would automatically create a relationship between those two assets. So there are a few different ways that relationships can be created either automatically, either manually, or through an ingest process. It you know, kind of depends on the actual use case. But either way, you can have that difference between manual and automatic. OK, great. I'm seeing a theme here. There's a few questions that are all kind of similarly related uh, with people who have a, a traditional uh, dam system. And um, how would something, could something like a, how could they be integrated with a system like this or um, upgraded or migrated to a system like this? So there's a couple of different ways on that. I think the, the thing about the graph database, it, in many cases it really is at the core. Um, the, the ability to bring and migrate it into existing systems um, can, can be done, but it generally does because of the data structure. You can, we can easily import data from a relational you know, current relational data structure um, into a graph database and utilize that information um, to be able to track additional information. However, the interfacing of the, the process of the, the current asset management system um, and how they would interface into the graph database on an ongoing basis does add a layer of complexity. So um, is it something that, that can be done very easily for existing systems? Not in all cases. There, I could say there are some some cases where it can be done if it's if it's pretty um, basic functionality, but it normally is something that you do have to kind of build your system around. So, Bill, if I can um, maybe ask the question a slightly different way, are there uh, current examples of using a graph database integrated with traditional hierarchical or relational databases? Yes, there are. As a matter of fact, um, in many cases, um, the implementations that we've been doing um, are almost always talking to a number of third-party systems and integrating them in. Normally, what we have uh, is we will either pull data in from those uh, hierarchical or, or relational data bases as necessary on an asset-by-asset -asset basis, but in other cases, we're actually pulling complete information in from, let's say, uh, an existing PIM system, and we're building that, that same PIM structure that they're utilizing in a relational database uh, within the graph database. And because we have the capabilities and the flexibility to be able to model just about any data structure, we can do that, uh, and now that data becomes very effective and useful in relating back to the assets that are living in the exist in this, in your or relational data structure. So you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You can keep your current metadata if it's functioning for you. And honestly, it might be a piece of technology that you don't want to touch. But you don't have to supplant that with a graph database. They can both live harmoniously. They can, Absolutely. yes. Yes. I think the important thing as well when you're thinking about migrating to a graph database is of the metadata that you currently have set up in your hierarchical database, what of that could actually be assets in a system and related to your other content. So a classic kind of example is the company. In a standard relational database or hierarchical database, the company will be a piece of metadata. It will be the name from a list or a text string. Within a graph database, what that will actually be is a relationship between a company and the asset itself. So you know, there are certain aspects of content currently traditionally held in those old style databases that may actually be changed a little bit to use in a graph database. For example, the company, the relationship, rather than a piece of fixed metadata. And that adds a lot of flexibility on the front end as well. So you don't have to be creating hard coding, I don't know, value lists or metadata on an admin client somewhere. What you can actually do is be creating assets and those relationships between them and that will build your kind of web of connections. Okay, I have a uh, looks like a three-part question here. 
It's asking how are the relationships created? How do you know what article or website the image is being linked to? It would seem that it, that would be hard to uh, keep track of the image usage. Right, so that can be done in a few different ways. We, the assets that I was showing in my presentation were actually on our own website, our own kind of part of the system that is a website. But you can also have flags. So you could have maybe this is going out to a third party website. It's not my website. I can define and set up that relationship between my asset, my image, and whatever website I'm sending it to as another asset. So I can see when it was sent, for example, with a published date. So even though that article or that image has gone outside of the system, I can actually track when it went outside of the system, when the process was initiated to actually export that article or export that image to that third party website, for example. And again, it comes back to that initial question of how are these relationships created. So there's a lot of ways that you can define those relationships. And you know, to be honest, lots of people, lots of companies have different requirements for relationships. So a traditional PIN structure, for example, might not work in a publishing environment or might not work in a manufacturer environment. So those relationships are completely configurable. You can define as many relationships as you like. You can then, of course, set up how you're going to export, what are you exporting to, what are your output channels. Um, the prime example I use is like uh, social media. So I can't, I can send something to social media. I'm not in control of Facebook, I'm not in control of Twitter or, or YouTube, for example, but I can send an image to Facebook and I capture the information of when I sent it and the fact that it's now connected to the Facebook social media channel because that's my export. So it's those kind of relationships that build you know, the context and allow me to track where I've sent information to. Does that answer the question? Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. We have, uh, we have another question coming in, and uh, this one's a little more complicated. What kind of taxonomies exist for expressing relationships ah. within the triples for dams to ensure an ability to share data across organizations over space and time? using a shared vocabulary? Well, part of the problem is the notion of having to have a locked shared vocabulary. In a graph database, you don't have to have a fixed rigid taxonomy. That, tox that taxonomy itself can be fluid, um, which is part of why it's so um, readily applicable to like language translations, for example. But you, you don't have to have a structured rigid taxonomy in a graph database. It is helpful when you start the process, for sure, but, sure, um, sure. And, but what you do is you will create um, that relevant to the specifics of, of your requirements from the base asset management structure, and then you can enhance that as you go, and, and Rich said there is no restrictions to it, so as, as the requirements change and develop, you can enhance that taxonomy very easily, uh, and you can build both those nodes, uh, assets, structures within the system and ultimately the relationships and so you can have any number of relationships within the system uh, and I define those relationships with really any type of taxonomy that's necessary. So um, Bill, I, I, I actually I'm glad this question came up because it was something I meant to uh, talk about in my presentation I totally forgot about it but I'm just going to go back here and look at this table in a traditional relational database there's a, a, a real cost. Like if you need to change this table or change that taxonomy at some point two years after you've implemented DAM, that it's doable, but there's a, some time and effort to do that. Correct, Bill? Yeah, that is correct. It is, it is quite extensive, actually, to go back in and re, re, restructure and ultimately re-index those tables within a relational, in a relational database. And, but we don't have that limitation within a graph database. At any point, I can change the taxonomy or the information about an asset, and I can have multiple different, I hate to use the word taxonomy, but you can have multiple different um, implementations of how you're describing two particular assets, that, and they're all is, valid. That is absolutely correct, and that is, like Kim, one of the advantages here is you can start out even with a standard basic digital asset management file, file management structure. Um, you can bring that into a graph data structure. Um, and then from that, as you're enhancing, you want to, and, and you're utilizing it more and more in the, those files in production, can be very effective. 
all of a sudden you now have the ability or the requirement that you want to an handle much more detailed product information uh, relevant to, say, some of the products that are going to be utilized and managed within that within that asset management structure. You have the ability now to generate product data structures um, utilizing those same digital images, digital content, text description information that was already in your asset management system. But you can completely restructure the data, and I say restructure, you can build a new parallel structure uh, of data that is specifically focused for the product information. So now the people that are using your product information system can use the same system with a similar with a similar data structure uh, and be able to take advantage of both the PIM capabilities but also direct access to all of the existing digital assets, image files, text descriptions, all those information available within the system. And ultimately MRM capabilities, DRM capabilities, all of these things can be done all in parallel because you have the flexibility to, re to structure that data in many different ways. And you're not replicating that data you're just taking it and building these different relationships between the existing data in the, within the system. Yeah, interesting. That was a great question, and, and I'm, I'm glad that one came up. Yeah, we actually have a follow-up to that. It says, but for discoverability, I need to know how one relationship is related to another. Do we then create triples mm -hmm. between relationships as well? Ooh, so a quad. <laughs> um, so do you create relations between relations? I would, I would create, well, first of all, a relationship is of a certain type. So you will have multiple, multiple relationships of different types. So for example, an image is placed into an InDesign output. That's a placement relationship. But maybe I'm building some ideas. I've got some kind of whiteboarding going on, and I want to collate things together. Maybe that's just a general user relationship. Maybe I've actually planned something for next week. That would be a planning relationship. So you have the ability to configure all of these different types of relationships and define what they should be related between. So for example, I don't need to have, um, let's, say, let's say there's no need for me to have a budget relationship between an image and an Excel file asset. So I can put filters on those different relationships so that it only allows me to relate certain types of assets together. So I can configure the different relationship types that I want and the filters on those, which is the parent, which is the child, etc. And you know what, what could be done in between. I'd like to show very quickly an example of metadata on a relationship, if I may. Um, I don't know if you can give me the presenter rights back, Rich. You should have them now. Great. So this is, again, another abstract view of this is a marketing plan in this example. And I have multiple different budget receivers, different countries in this example here. So of those different budget receivers, Austria, France, etc., they have a certain cut of the budget for this particular global marketing plan. But there's no point in me putting that cut on the actual Austria marketing plan itself, because it only exists when it's related to this particular European marketing plan. So rather than putting metadata on a single asset, which actually doesn't make sense because it only has that piece of information when it's related to this particular global larger marketing plan, for example. So what we do is we can have metadata on relations. So if I edit the relation metadata here, we can see the actual budget is only available when these two assets are related together or is only there when those two assets are related together. Because it doesn't belong here, and it doesn't belong here, but it does belong on that relationship itself. So that's another kind of level to how you can capture information about content, about assets. If I can try and uh, answer that a slightly different way, you mm -hmm. can also have a superset of relations. So you could have a relation between, going back to, to Mary and the Mazda, that she liked it on Facebook, she posted it on Instagram, she retweeted it. Each of those are their own unique relations, but you can have a superset that says social, basically. So when you're doing a, a search, you can say, only show me the relationship types that are social, and it will only bring back those results. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we got uh, lots of questions rolling in here, so um, let me jump to the next one here. Um, I have one here. Are there specific off-the-shelf tools or softwares that allow for the viewing or retrieval of the relationships in the graph database, or are organizations largely developing their own tools? So there are systems that take place in, in the case of you know different asset management systems. Um, those tools are, are generally built into those specific systems. There are other standalone graph databases that are available that you can pull information in. Uh, there's a number of open source ones. Um, but the interface to extract that information and visualize that information is usually directly related to those specific uh, tool sets. There are others that are out there to say that, that will have some standard APIs that will allow you to build custom interfaces uh, for for visualizing that information, uh, but uh, like I say there's for for a lot of the asset management systems where they're really focused on asset management systems, they are built into the tools themselves. So now I have a, another two-part question on how what we use. I have do you use Excel, PowerPoint, or SendShare, um, and how do you connect with social media? It's a good I'm question. Not sure. I'm not sure on the Excel PowerPoint venture. Can they elaborate on that one? Oh. Yeah, I don't have any elaboration on that right now. But uh, we can address how we connect with social media, possibly. Yes, absolutely. So um, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all of those social media outputs have different APIs, of course, because they can connect. And the way we would connect to, let me just try and find one here while I'm talking, um, that social media output, that Facebook, that Twitter, would be a channel asset, an output channel asset. And that output channel is connected to the Facebook API, obviously. But I would then see, through that channel, the relationships to all of the assets that I've output to that social media post. So again, we, we actually, everything is an asset. Everything can be an asset, including the output channels, including the posts that we're sending to those output channels and the information about when we sent it. So I don't know if that's sufficient as an answer. I think I got the follow-up to the uh, Excel. It says the application that you use where the channel goes. I think that's uh, connected to the, um, the Excel um, okay. PowerPoint. So let me show you a quick screenshot. I'll just share my screen very quickly. Um, you should be able to see it any second now. This is my social media channel for Facebook. And I can see that a Facebook post has been created that has this video as the media and was sent by this person, this author. So this is how we would do the relations, the, 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 the contextual information between an output channel, like social media in this example, and content, actual files that we want to export to that social media channel and other relationships like, for example, the author. So that would be how we would set up the different outputs, obviously, social media being one of them. Okay, the next question is, what is a great, great database uh, graph database structure that you suggest using for social, etc.? I'm not sure I understand the question. One more time, please. Sorry, Damien. It is, what is a great graph database structure that you suggest using? I'll probably pass that one over to Bill. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not a problem. So there, there are definitely a number of different ones out there. Um, and in reality, it's quite interesting because uh, Facebook, YouTube, a lot of these uh, social media environments, they're actually all at their core are utilizing graph databases. And so we can map in many cases along what some of the similarities are that, um, that they are using. Um, but it really does come down to what the audience is for your specific needs and requirements. If you are looking at uh, specifics around you know, types of, of users that you want information about, that you want to track, uh, back to kind of what Rich was saying in the presentation, Relevance to what your needs are and requirements ultimately is the key. And as we go through what we normally will do when we're setting these up, we will effectively go out and whiteboard what those requirements are, what those structures are, and then we can map those along with some of 
some existing known data structures, um, and then ultimately customize it to your specific needs and requirements. And again, the nice thing about the graph data based structure is that it is incredibly flexible. It's not a situation where we have to go in and create a lot of tables and then interrelationships between those tables um, and index all of that information to be able to search and, ma and manage that. We literally, what you can write on a, on a whiteboard actually is the data structure that we can create within the system. So I have a couple questions in regards to how do you search on this. Uh, show me, for example, all photos shot in X country. So, right, sorry, uh, I was <laughs> just uh, just quickly on the yeah. Yes, sure. of course. Um, so you can, in a proper graph database, actually search on those relationships. So I would be able to search. Let me just have a share my screen here. Um, this is an example of how I would set up a search. Perhaps I'm looking for all the images that are related to a certain event, for example. I would look for that relationship, either a child or parent. I would look for the type of relationship, and then I would be more specific, you know, and is related to this particular, you know, the name of that is X, Y, Z. So I can actually search, because of that contextuality of graph databases, I can search on those relationships. Or what I can also do is look in here, let's say, um, we had Rome, I think, was one of my uh, examples. If we can find Rome, oh, beg pardon. Again, non-prepared, that's always the way. Um, it was the race of the champions. So I can do a search, and I can see all the different assets that we have in here. The race of the champions was an event. I can filter down and see the actual resulting asset that I want. And when I click on it, I can see the relationships, and I can see what it's related to. Or I could do that kind of complex search, just set up the search very easily and look for assets that have a relationship with Race of the Champions, for example. Okay, I and I'll... Um, the question. Yeah, I think so. Uh, what kind of um, reports can be generated on the, uses of, the usage of these types of assets? So the fact that an asset has a relationship is actually captured on the asset XML itself. And that asset XML can be pulled in forms of reports and searches, obviously. So we can pull out that XML information, output a report. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty easy. It's kind of, it's not metadata, it's a relationship, but it's captured within, as information on the asset itself. And that in itself can be searched upon and drilled upon and output for reports, for example. Right. Yeah, so to add on to that, as she's saying, you can be drilled upon. So in, in, as part of those reports, we can pull information um, both up and down the relationship structure. So we can look not only at the asset and those, that metadata around the asset um, and those direct relationships, but if we have awareness, we can actually look at related um, relationships. So parent relationships up the chain or down the chain. Uh, if there's multiple child relationships, so we can query up and down those tabs um, to extract in specific information that's required. So you have a lot of flexibility with regards to the information that is being pulled uh, or available to uh, to be able to generate those reports. Okay, I have someone who wanted to see uh, on the display uh, how to apply metadata and the how you apply metadata in the relationships. Is that something we'd be able to show in the system here? I could certainly show an example of it, yes. Um, just one second, let me get my um, marketing plan back up here. Let me show my screen. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep. This is a marketing plan. Now in Century, again, it's one of those abstract types of assets, so it's a container. And as part of that container, we have different countries that are taking, you know, taking part in this marketing plan. We have different projects, different projects, and again, just to show you how that would work with relationships, you know, here is a relationship example. These are all intrinsically related to each other, including tasks that are related perhaps to people. But let's go on to our budget side here. These countries are part of this marketing plan. But we don't want to have a specific budgetary information on that actual country because it only, it's only in effect when there is a relationship between, for example, Austria and the marketing plan. So if we click on that kind of child asset, we have the option to edit relation metadata. And here we've got a budget of, I don't know, if we could type this in. Um, maybe we're going to do it in euros, not sure. 
but that is now metadata on that relationship and the changes will be done accordingly. So depending on the type of relationship between the assets, depends on what metadata you can add and if you can add metadata, maybe you don't want to have that, but it's just a case then of defining what that metadata is going to be and yeah, setting it up. That answers the question. Okay, this is part of the uh, question too was defining, Wendy, I don't know, just defining a relationship too. Can you? Of course. So here we a have. Different um, ways that it can be done. Yeah. Sure. So here I've got a big long list of, of countries, for example. Um, maybe what I want to do is actually remove Austria from here. So what I can do is I can remove that relationship, either again manually or automatically. So now Austria is gone. We can see it's gone from the list. But maybe I want to create that again. Let's, let's go and add that relationship back again. I want to have in here Austria. And we should get Austria. And that's how I can create a very simple relationship from there. But you can then create more. So if I go back to my tasks, for example, and have a look at my, um, my graph, Mr. Graph, or whatever his name was, John, <laughs> who loved Mary, we can actually create relationships very easily, manually. So he's the author of, I don't know, Mazda Racing. If we could spell it, it always helps, right? Uh, Mazda Racing, he's the author of that. I've just created a relationship. I'm just going to create a relationship between him and the department, maybe. Let's say he's in there. Let's say he's got some open task. We can, we can add relationships at any point and different types of relationships depending on which of these widgets you use. So again, these are specific relationship types just set up in the preview. And again, you can have that manually or automatically. For example, if I added this picture of him onto an InDesign page, there would be an automatic relationship created. Is that a thumbs up okay? That's good. Um, the next, I have another two-part question. Someone asking um, if the images that are displayed are low res or um, or the you know are the original image high res. And um, to tail onto that, will the thumbnail show on the screen support multiple file formats? So um, that's a good question. And it goes back to our concept of an asset not being a file. So of course, um, if this, we take an image asset, that image asset will have the master file for that asset, which will be the high res TIFF, whatever it may be. But you will also have a preview of that, which you can define by standard 72 DPI RGB. Um, there'll be a thumbnail, which again is a smaller resolution. So you can define what types of files sit inside an asset. Because if we take a person, for example, you know, there are no files for a person. A person is a person. But an image, for example, would have the high-res master file, the preview, the thumbnail, maybe a watermarked version, maybe different types of files for that, different resolutions, different color spaces, depending on what you want to do with it. And in the case of the assets in this one specifically where she was talking about the person asset, even though so the person itself is an asset, not a file, but you can then go in and assign a preview. So maybe you do have that a, a small low resolution image or a you know, medium resolution image. Uh, you can then place that image as a preview. And you can do that for any asset within the system. So you may have a product grouping. So you've got a product asset within the system. And there may be a number of different uh, visuals that are part of that product grouping, each an individual asset unto themselves. But maybe you have an overall shot that is a shot of a bicycle um, with all of its components. The, the product itself can be, is, is actually showing all of the components as you drill down into the child assets of that. But you can have one primary image that you want to then assign to that product, uh, even though there, it's not a file itself, it's just a container. You can assign a, a preview for that so that you can get a good visualization for that. And that also helps with files or, or yeah, for files specifically computer friendly. For example, you may have files that are for different different types of equipment to display or whatever. You can still store them as assets inside Sensei. You can still store the file and you can also allocate a preview to it so you can see what that strange file type asset is going to, to look like as an example. Uh, Damien, I, I'm, do we have any other questions? I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Oh, and yes, yes. We'll, We'll certainly answer any questions. Uh, we're happy to uh, continue on. If there's something that you didn't feel like putting in the chat, uh, please feel free to uh, drop any one of us an email. Uh, this is what we do for a living. We're happy to uh, provide as much information as we can. 
Yes, Rich, we have a couple more questions. So for those who want to stay on, um, we'll definitely answer a few more questions, and uh, all the rest of them we can follow up with you uh, if you just put them in the box. Um, I have a question here um, where someone is asking, how does a search look when hundreds of InDesign files are connected to an image, for example? It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> awesome. It looks great. <laughs> well, that happens quite a bit, especially when you're looking at like campaigns for advertisers or marketers, and they may have a single hero image that's, um, you know, a retouched, approved, polished image that everybody agrees on that's used across a whole bunch of different marketing material. You can, in the graph database, you can show that relationship between that single image and all of the InDesign documents that it's placed into. In, in, in addition to that, you have the ability to assign, Wendy was, I think, discussing earlier, the ability to have different types of relationships. So early in the process, you may have, as you're, as you're planning the, uh, the document, you're planning the, the layouts, you're planning the different page requirements, you can early on assign those, uh, those images to specific layouts even before the InDesign document itself has been created. So you may have within a retail environment, you have products that you want to utilize within a section of the of the of a catalog or some pages that you're using or on individual pages. You can assign those to those pages without actually having to place them in the document. Once that's done, once they're assigned to that document, maybe you've got a designer that will then open up that document, they will be able to see immediately all the assigned images that were uh, for that specific page, that were planned for that page. Um, and then ultimately, once they place those op files into the document, the relationship will automatically change from an assigned or planned relationship to a placed relationship. So now, without any user intervention, you actually know exactly what, what images were actually used within that document. You can still see all the ones that were planned for potentially to be used, but were not used. And that's very handy sometimes um, when you're looking at, OK, what was planned for this, but what was not used? So those are all searches and, and reports that you can utilize. Um, but you can see exactly what was placed in each individual document. And again, all that happens automatically as the processes will change. So that's, that's really one of the, the great pieces about this with those relationship types is you can have multiple relationship types and you can use that information to dig very deep into what's happening within the system. And, and let me actually show you what it looks like. So let me just share my screen with you. We, I took that image um, that we saw in the presentation originally. I can see that this image has been placed in multiple assets. I don't have all the details in here, but if I click on that relationship, I can then see what those, where it's been placed, specifically in the InDesign. So now I've got um, two InDesigns and two, three XML articles, for example. So you obviously could have more, but I can click on that relationship. I can go back and actually see you know, the relations that we have specifically in that type of relationship. So I hope that made sense. OK, I have a question. Um, does the solution have to be on premise? Oh, for, oh sorry. My, I should <laughs> does the solution have to be on premise for the placed relationships to show? Not at all. There's no, there's no correlation between um, location of the system and the different types of relationships. And you actually have the ability to track relationships to, to things that are off the system. And depending on the interface, um, that can be either a live interaction with those or it can be an update interaction. So it will query and update the information on, on a regular basis. Uh, or it can just be a remote. You can just put a URL reference in, into an asset so that will allow you to um, click on that asset and then go to that remote location without any other direct connection to it. So there's a lot of flexibility in that also. OK, and this one's kind of straightforward. Um, I, I, I think we might have covered it a little bit, but someone wanted to know about, like, you know, can we, can we track that history and how is that, you know, how far back can you track the history of an asset? And, of course, relationships yes. and whatnot. absolutely, absolutely. So the asset, um, every asset that's edited inside the system will have a version tracked to it. So every time the asset is changed and maybe metadata's changed, maybe the relationships changed, maybe the files changed, that will all be tracked inside the system and be available, depending on what you want to do um, for restoration. You can restore that file back or restore that asset version back. Um, but you also have control over that. I mean, there's nothing worse than 
200 versions of a 250 meg image file clogging up your file system. So you can control that on a more granular level before we frighten everybody. Uh, the follow-up to that is, is that via plug-in in Adobe CC? Like, how does that work? It depends on the type of asset. It's for any type of asset. So any type of asset has a history and versions accordingly, whether it be an a InDesign file or in copy file or a picture or a person or a marketing plan, it doesn't really matter. Every single type of asset will have version control and history. So yeah, if, if it's, um, if it's a, an InDesign layout, for example, we would store the file from that previous version as part of the asset. And there's no kind of correlation with um, InDesign or CC unless you actually want to open it in that particular tool. Hope that makes sense. And if, there is, and, and if there is a requirement, as we, and it may have been, that question may too have been related to some of the early things we were talking about, how the placement information and tracking that information mm -hmm. um, with the document, that does, that does utilize um, plugins because it's communicating between two separate systems. And so the, the plugin capabilities within the Adobe CC uh, tools are, you know, allow you to do that, but it does have some plugins so that the system, the software on your local system is communicating with the uh, with the mm -hmm. system and Great. updating the data. Great. So um, I had a question here. Uh, I will answer the first part, but then I'll let Wendy elaborate. Uh, the system being demoed here is what? This is SendShare, and we will be putting together a resource page uh, at, for uh, everybody who attended this, and we'll have additional product information, white papers, et cetera, to follow up. But is there anything you wanted to cover for SendShare, uh, Wendy? Well, if anybody is interested and they're in LA on Thursday and Friday for the Henry Stewart in LA, then I will also be there. So go and find me. Happy to have a chat. I'll be in LA as well. Um, I'm sorry, Rich. Work. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I wasn't in on purpose. <laughs> That's actually, there'll be several people from IO Integration and Censure at uh, Dam LA for sure. Absolutely. And it looks like I got someone trying to type a question here, but it didn't quite come through. Um, I think we're all caught up on the questions. So I think, for now, I think I would like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, we'll take all these questions and look through them again, see if we missed anything. And as I mentioned, we will be putting together a resource page to follow up with you in the next couple of days uh, and make sure you have additional um, information and resources um, to cover. Actually, the question came through that I was, uh, <laughs> uh, that I was, that didn't come through the first time now. So let's go ahead and answer this. Can you show the timetable calendar of a campaign? Show the assets, InDesign or whatever, and how they're complete, how they are completed? Yes, you can. Um, I assume that's a, can we do it now? One second. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably that Gantt chart view, Wendy, yes, where you can right. explode out the... Sorry, I'm trying to fill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. <laughs> just one second, I'll get it. I actually just closed the, the, the screen, as Damien said. Well, it looks like that's... <sighs> so there you go. Right. Um, let's have a look here. Let me try and find it first of all. And then I'm good to go. So right, let's show my screen. So this is my, um, hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. This is my marketing plan, for example. So it has, again, different types of assets related to it. And if, you look into, if I look into my budget area, again, these are just assets. Anything can be an asset. And if I scroll down and just kind of open up these relationships, I can see that for the German kind of campaign or project, if you like, for this marketing plan, I've got different tactics or different campaigns underneath and different tactics. And then, again, different tasks. These are just assets. Tasks are just another type of asset. However, with tasks, what you can do is you can define start and end dates or durations, etc. So that then allows us to visualize what that's going to look like on a time frame here with this particular project plan. So these tasks, if we have a look, I don't know if this is actually done because I didn't check this bit, but um, let's go into request images. It's an asset, and I can have relationships in here. So I know what tasks have got to be done. Maybe I've got to have somebody to upload this. Maybe I've got InDesign assets in here. Um, it's very easy to do. Let's have a look. Layout, for example. There we go. So let's have some layout. Maybe it's assigned to this, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and for example. 
Okay, so you can assign, you can make those relationships between tasks, between anything, depending on how it's set up. So in my system, I can create relationships between tasks and InDesign layouts. Um, maybe in your system you want to relate it to images or whatever it may be. Did that answer your question? I hope. Yeah, I think so, Wendy. Excellent. Okay, great. So we're going to wrap up. Uh, once again, we will be following up. Um, if you have any immediate questions, you can email Rich directly at rich.carroll. That's C-A-R-R-O-L-L. -L. So that's rich.carroll at iointegration.com, and he'll be happy to field any other questions that come through. And we will be um, following up with uh, many more resources for you and give you a little more information on uh, how these systems can benefit your team. So once again, thank you on behalf of IO Integration, SendShare, and thank you to um, Henry Stewart for uh, providing this forum for us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye now.